You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Okay, now let's address another movement for change, Chicano power. Like, uh, like the younger generation of African Americans, the younger generations of Mexican American activists in the late 1960s and early 1970s emphasized their own distinct cultures and their histories. In the United Farm Workers Strike of California from 1965 to 1970, grape growers were brought to the negotiating table as a result of the national consumer boycott of table grapes. La Raza Unida was funded, was founded in the Southwest in the 1970s by Chicano activists and was instrumental in registering tens of thousands of new voters through what would become known as the Southwest Voter Registration Project. So let's go to a movement, uh, let's go to a film clip from a documentary on the Chicano movement and let's appreciate Chicano power. So let's go to film clip six. Nineteen sixty eight was a time in which the entire planet was feeling the reverberations of a new a new spirit. It certainly it was going on in Mexico. It was going on in France. It was going on all over the United States with students of every single state and college and town demanding that there was and had to be a better alternative to what was going on in the world at that time. The Vietnam War was a big issue for everybody, particularly for Chicanos because we were dying there at higher proportions to anyone else. And no one was acknowledging that so that our contributions didn't mean anything to the country. And we saw reflected in the world that people thought that something could be done. And we felt that we had to do what we could do with our lives as well. That was a time in 1968. There was never a school term like this one. It began with a simple protest by students who wanted a better education. School officials became involved, and the parents, then the police, and the FBI. Before long, school children were branded as subversive. Their lives threatened, all because they wanted a better education. East Los Angeles. In the 1960s, this was home to almost 100,000 Mexican Americans. It was the largest barrio in the United States. Growing up in East Los Angeles, I wasn't actually aware of it as a, as a young child, but it, it soon became apparent that uh, I grew up in a very isolated, very segregated neighborhood a community that was totally separate from the rest of Los Angeles.
Education was seen as a way to break down those barriers. A way for young people to one day have what everyone else had. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about the Chicano movement. Let's talk about Chicano power. Now, Chicano power marks the culmination of previous generations' organizational endeavors. And basically, a cultural renaissance is occurring within the Mexican communities of the Southwest, the Midwest, and in the North. The dominant society is going to be forced to contend with a new resistance to old ingrained prejudices and old ingrained judicial practices. One of the things about Chicano power was that it gave and continues to give people the basis for cultural pride, the basis for ethnic pride. And one of the things about the Chicano movement was that it affected the culture, the lifestyles, the family relationships, and the politics of the community. Actually, all Spanish-speaking communities. The movement, the Chicano movement, the Chicano power movement was distinctively different than any other movement preceding it. And it affected people differently and at different times. But it affected directly and indirectly every Spanish-speaking person from the Western Hemisphere. It didn't matter if you were from Central America, South America, the Caribbean, if you were Cuban, if you were Puerto Rican, if you were Salvadoran. The Chicano movement impacted every Spanish-speaking person. Now, there were two main sectors in the movement. It was an urban sector and a rural sector. The rural sector belongs in the labor movement under the organizational struggle of the United Farm Workers. But what was important about the United Farm Workers was the UFW was a symbol of social change. It was a symbol of resistance. The UFW was a symbol of the heightening of ethnic consciousness. And most importantly, the United Farm Workers, their use of the effective tactics of nonviolence, of the boycott, and political confrontation was so effective in generating awareness amongst the Mexican communities. There was the urban sector. And the urban sector consisted of older organizations from the World War II generation. And it consisted of grassroots organizations of community organizing. And most importantly, student movements. But what was also significant was the international human rights movements that was occurring as a result of rebellions in Latin America and in Africa. So we're going to go to visit the documentary called Chicano, A History of the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement, and we're going to appreciate that the, ro the role that students played in bringing about awareness for social change and the development of consciousness. And let's appreciate how education is so important for people to break down the barriers that separate us from the other, the not me, the stranger at the gate. So let's go to film clip number seven. I was buying into this whole thing about the American dream, get an education, you can be whatever you want to be, and, and I, you know, read all these books and listen to the teachers. Even though at the back of my mind I'm saying something's going on here, you know, I, the, the reality that I see here is different from what you're saying. Something was definitely wrong. Only one out of four Chicanos completed high school. The dropout rate was really kind of what some people called a push-out rate. I mean, these were students who were being pushed out of school because uh, their needs weren't being met, their culture was not addressed, the school really wasn't doing anything for them. Unemployment was almost double the national average. Those who were earned about two-thirds of what other Los Angeles residents earned. These conditions had a dramatic impact on Mexican-American children. I started elementary school in the uh, early 1950s, and I was uh, the only student in my uh, kindergarten class that was a monolingual Spanish-speaking child. And uh, I was immediately led to the front of the class, and uh, I was instructed on how to uh, create a cone hat out of uh, construction paper uh, the teacher painted a word on it and told me I could take it off when I learned to speak English and the word she had painted on that was the word Spanish. I remember going to elementary school taking my tacos of uh, frijoles and meat and rice and being made fun of by the other kids in, in, in junior high especially to the point where I didn't want to take tacos de carne 
to school. I wanted to take bologna sandwiches. I remember feeling ashamed, you know, when my father would go to school because he didn't speak good English and translating for him. Feeling ashamed of being Mexican and which fed this growing anger in me. And I think those same things were, you know, infecting everyone else and everyone responded in a different way. The burden was pretty heavy, you know, in terms of the shame of not feeling that your parents were worth anything because the teachers and the schools treated them like children. There were clear signs of prejudice and discrimination. I remember vividly when I was an honor student being asked by the white consular what my father did for a living and me telling her, well, you know, uh, he's a laborer, you know, uh, he works with his hands. And then she told me, and I'll never forget this, these were the exact words, that is a very honorable profession. You should follow in your father's footsteps. My homemaking teacher, she would say, you know, you little Mexicans, you better learn and pay attention. This class is very important because, you know, uh, most of you are going to be cooking and cleaning for other people. It was real clear to me that there was a definite tracking system. Some students went into um, the academia tracking and were, were being prepared to go to college. Others were being tracked into going into the shop classes, into the vocational areas. It wasn't that there was anything wrong with, with that, but you didn't have a choice. You were tracked into those areas. Students were grouped into the classes, generally based on uh, some kind of ability rating. Usually it was IQ. The lower groups didn't get the same benefits and also didn't get the same support for uh, going to college. Gradually, these students realized they were not alone in their frustrations. I heard that there were many more students who had the same kind of yearning and anger and desire to do something with their lives and not be stereotyped and uh, pegged into uh, being some sort of commodity for labor. A lot of us had the same sort of complaints about what was happening in our lives as far as our education. So we decided to take a survey. That's when we start to gather that information and start interacting with the school district saying, you're not meeting our needs. And look at, uh, you know, people are saying they don't get college advisements. Uh, kids are saying that they get pushed out of school, that discipline is not fair. They went from better food all the way to, you know, we want to go to college. We have the lowest reading rate in East L.A. in the, in the East Side schools. We have graduates that graduate from high school, that graduate that are in the 12th grade, that graduate and are out to face the world and can only read an uh, 8th and a ninth grade reading level. And we believe this is a crisis. Uh, we were just being passed because of our age and nothing else. So they really didn't care if we learned how to read or we knew how to spell or anything else like that. It was just a matter of, you know, okay, just go. I think the bottom line is the lack of concern of the teachers towards the kids and whether the kids were really getting an education or not. Uh, the reality set in that uh, teachers weren't really concerned for the kids. Students called for bilingual instruction, Mexican-American history courses, an end to corporal punishment, and the hiring of more Mexican-American teachers and counselors. Their efforts transformed America's understanding of what was meant by civil rights. They presented their demands to the Los Angeles School Board. They felt like we were not counseling them, but we're trying to have them go into industrial arts. Well, that wasn't true at all. We were trying our best to get as many to go on to a four-year school as would. What can we do when we do not have the actual authority to control what the whole of society is doing? If we could distribute everybody equally and have equal funds everywhere and have equal quality of teachers, there would be no problem. They patted us on the back, 
And my recollection was is that they literally just threw away the results of our survey. And that began to politicize us. The students were facing a problem that had for years caused concern within their community. As early as the turn of the century, Mexican-American families called for educational reform. They protested the segregation of their children in so-called Mexican schools, where teachers severely punished Mexican-American students for speaking Spanish in the classroom. Keep in mind that the Spanish language for many Mexicans is almost a characteristic of being Mexican. It's a defining characteristic, not an incidental characteristic. Young children were taught that the culture of their community, of their parents, was really a hindrance to success. If a child learned these kinds of things, he began then to look upon his cultural background, upon his parents, upon his community, in a negative way. So you treat them and you teach them at the lowest common denominator of labor and how to use your hands. And you get them out into the fields and into jobs as quickly as possible. That was the Mexican experience in schools. By 1946, parents in Santa Ana, California, were fed up. They filed suit against local school officials and won. Mendes versus the Westminster School District declared the segregation of Mexican-American children to be unlawful. It set the stage for the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision Brown versus Board of Education, which declared segregated schools unconstitutional throughout the United States. Despite this ruling, segregated schools remained, and even in integrated settings, Mexican-American students still suffered from neglect and unequal resources. The end result of this is that the uh, Mexican children were given an inferior education, which prepared them for menial kinds of positions and jobs as cheap laborers, the kinds of positions that their parents filled. Our greatest resource is the skill and the vision and the wisdom of our people. If your education falters or fails, everything else that we attempt as a nation will fail. If you succeed, America will succeed. Over half of all the Mexican-American children have less than eight years of school. How long can we pay that price? There's a vast ignorance about the Mexican, and consequently there's a, there's a myth that the Mexican is pliable, he is non-resistant, and that anybody can do anything to him that anybody wishes. Well, this isn't true. But now that he's become an urban Mexican, and now that there's a more numerous generation of... Uh, Dr. Mexican Ernesto Galarza, school, a longtime labor activist and educator, sensed that traditional perceptions uh, of the Mexican-American community the were about to be challenged. Uh, the tensions within the Mexican community are increasing, and they show themselves in the current protest movements. Despite the earlier efforts to improve education, a half century of frustration was about to explode in the East Los Angeles schools. This was a time in which enough Chicano students had gained mastery of the tools that were necessary to shake up the system and had taken the ideals of the country to heart and so uh, we protested for our rights. It was the political evolution of a group of young Chicanos in East LA from being involved in community civic-minded activities as young citizens for community action and then becoming culturally aware of their background, their history, their race, and becoming young Chicanos for community action and asserting their real identity and then getting involved and realizing that the system wouldn't change unless you became more, more direct action. During that time, we were building support. We were all talking to other students at campuses. We were talking to teachers. People were talking to their parents. Um, and we were building support in the community. I was a first year graduate student and I was involved in the initial organizing of UMAS 
which stands for the United Mexican American Students. And uh, we had begun to talk with other leaders in the area at other campuses that we needed to commit ourselves as college students uh, to the betterment of our uh, community and in particular to changing things for the betterment of our sisters and brothers in the high schools, for example, in the elementary schools. Sal Castro, an outspoken history teacher, helped to organize the students. For years, the schools have wrapped where it blamed the, the Mexican home for not doing a good job in educating the kid. In other words, if the kid doesn't go to school, it's a Mexican parent's fault or the Mexican home's fault. Well, I have yet to see a Mexican kid come into school at the age of five or six years of age not knowing a language. Castro grew up in East Los Angeles, where he learned firsthand the problems within these he schools. Is, he has learning readiness, or he's, he's ready to learn when he walks into school. So it's not the fault. It's never, it has never been the fault of the Mexican home. His activism was shaped by vivid memories from his youth. In the 1930s, Sal's father was deported to Mexico, part of a U.S. repatriation program provoked by the Great Depression. In the 1940s, he witnessed the Zoot Suit riots when U.S. soldiers and sailors attacked Mexican Americans in the streets of Los Angeles. By the spring of 1968, Sal Castro knew clearly what he was up against. Most teachers approach the Mexican as with a negative attitude and that you have nothing to give to me. I am going to make you an Anglo come hell or high water and whatever you have to say about it makes no difference. We had to now say the schools are not working. They're taking our taxpayers' money, the hard money that our fathers and mothers worked for and not returning in any way. We're the only ones losing out. A massive walkout to shut down the schools was what we somehow decided on. Change wasn't going to come from within, it had to come from without.